Almighty God, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you that you long to speak to us. And so, Lord, as we focus upon your word now, give us receptive hearts. Help us to hear your message for each of us this morning and grant us obedience that we may serve you. As Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Believe me when I say that the irony of preaching on the topic, our house, while I'm making preparations for the winter night shelter for the homeless has not passed me by. But more about the homeless next month at the dedication of the night shelter volunteers. But today is London Open House, and I thought it was a good theme to link into. Now, when I moved to London just over three years ago now, I had no idea what London Open House was. Uh, I'm not sure that news of this event has travelled beyond the Watford Gap, I have to say. And so it does appeal to my wacky sense of humour when people are talking excitedly about something, assuming that you know all about it, when really you're stood in the middle thinking, I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. So, if any of you visitors aren't sure what London Open House is, I will share with you what I have learned. Open House London is the world's biggest architecture festival. Isn't that amazing? And it's giving free, my favourite price, free public access to over 800 buildings, walks, talks and tours in a weekend in September. And we're at that weekend here in 2017. And the first Open House London took place in 1992. So if you do your sums really, really quickly, we're actually in the Silver Jubilee year this year. And this year, highlights range from famous landmarks, including Battersea Power Station, the Royal Albert Hall, the Shard, still not being there yet, uh, to private houses that are considered architecturally interesting or unique. And tens of thousands of people will embrace this opportunity to visit some of the 800 plus buildings. And Methodist Central Hall, Westminster, is one of those buildings. And volunteers here today will welcome visitors. There'll be tours of the hall, an opportunity to climb into the dome. I've still not done that. I'm too scared of heights. Um, But I understand it is worth overcoming your vertigo to see the fantastic view up there. But this building has great architectural significance. For example, this dome here, I wasn't aware until I did my research, is the second largest unsupported dome ceiling in the world. Whoa, I do go, whoa. We sat here every Sunday. This is the second largest unsupported dome ceiling in the world. And people will come and see it today. Some of you may have taken the grand staircase, which was inspired by the Paris Opera House. This is an amazing building. Lots of all other architectural uh, information. It's a great building, isn't it? And yes, we are a tourist attraction. But what is also significant is that this is where we worship. This is where we worship. And what is going to make our house stand out against the 800 plus other buildings today? Well, let's just park that there for a moment and we will pick that up again later. And in the meantime, let's take a look at Joshua. Because when we reach chapter 24, we are at the end of Joshua's life. And it's at this point that he stands before the Israelites to deliver his farewell address. 
And things have gone well under his leadership. And now Joshua takes this moment to deliver his speech, to review all that God has done and to remind the people of their obligations under their covenant with God. It's also significant here that Joshua ends with a deep act, uh, an act of deep symbolism. That wasn't included in the reading that we gave uh, May this morning. The Israelites at the end of Joshua finally bury the remains of Joseph. This, this was an instruction that he made at the end of Genesis. And so during the 40 years of the wilderness wanderings, the tribes had carried Joseph's bones as a reminder of their past. And now as they bury them, it's deeply symbolic that they are now home. So Joshua takes this opportunity in his address to remind the Israelites of their story. So let's just take you through 400 years very, very quickly, okay? Began with the call of Abraham, the deliverance from Egypt, the escape via the Red Sea, their journey through the wilderness, deliverance from the schemes of Balak and Balaam, the capture of Jericho, a favorite story with our young people. The defeat of many Canaanite nations. I'm so glad, May, I didn't have to do that reading this morning. There are a lot of ites in that reading, aren't there? Lots of ites. Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, etc., etc., etc. These ites are significant, okay? They're not just put there for the sake of it. They're significant because back in Deuteronomy chapter 7, we learn that they were seven nations larger and stronger than Israel. And God enabled Israel to defeat them all. So this potted history is much more than recounting events in Israel's history. It's not about helping them to remember important dates. This history is told with a purpose. And that purpose is that the, that the people should recognize all that God has done for them. Sometimes it's good to pause and reflect. And this is happening here. Indeed, it is the promise of the land that is central to the recounting of the story of Israel. And Joshua emphasizes here, and this is important, that God is the sole source of their success. As we heard in chapter 24, I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. It is God who has given them the land. It is God who has driven out great and powerful nations. And now they are home. And this is not an invitation for the Israelites to say to God, well, thank you, Lord, you've done some amazing things and we can take it from here now. So see ya. It's really not what it's about at all. It's very often and too often, and Joshua recognizes this, that it is all too easy to lose sight of what God has done, even if it's happened in the recent past. We are guilty of forgetting what God has done for us. The result of God's faithfulness as exhibited in their rich history is that Israel can now celebrate the blessing of life in the land that was promised to them all those years ago. And so on the basis of God's mighty deeds, the people are challenged to be loyal to him. You must hold fast to the Lord your God 
And Joshua hoped that the Israelites would choose God and hold on to their choice in the days and years ahead. How will their past affect their present and their future? How are they going to respond? Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, Joshua knew the power of example. We talk a lot about role models these days. So to paraphrase, perhaps, you can do as you will, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua's review of the past must affect the way that the Israelites conduct themselves in the present and the future. God's faithfulness to us means that we must be faithful to him too in the way that we live. This is so important because there is another aspect of Israel's history. Joshua recognizes an issue which would plague Israel and which continued to plague the church throughout the ages. And this is the problem, what we might call partial discipleship, in which people are prepared to claim the benefits of life in covenant with God, but not live out its demands. And most pointedly, that does mean here removing all other gods from among the community. What God wants, and in fact what he's always wanted, is a people who are committed to him and to him alone. In fact, we're mindful that that is the first commandment. And it's a challenge that Jesus presents to us today. While we may not be tempted to serve the gods from across the river, we still have other issues that we need to confront, such as wealth and comfort, etc. We really need to beware, because part-time service of God is really no service at all. And Joshua appeals to Israel to commit themselves to serve God, or Yahweh here, absolutely. You must serve God, absolutely. And he challenges them to understand that because God is absolutely faithful to his people, so he also expects his people to be faithful to him. Israel cannot keep other gods and serve Yahweh. That is not sincere worship. That is compromise. And that is not an option. The land was promised to Abraham. And entry to it was always the goal of the exodus. However, there was a significant delay a significant delay between the initial promise to Abraham and the entry to the land. That delay, as I said, was 400 years. And during those 400 years, Israel needed to live out what it meant to be God's people. So, Returning to where we left the hall parked earlier on, let us go and retrieve it. The hall has a story too. We possess a land. The area that the hall is built on was once the home of the Royal Aquarium. Now the land is the home of the church. And our story is about the gospel of God's unconditional love, of mercy, transformation, justice, grace, and welcome. For we are the community of the forgiven. 
People are astute. They know where they're not welcome. You don't even have to say to them, you're not welcome here. They sense it. And when that happens in church, and it happens, sadly, they don't come back. So maybe today is a good opportunity for us to remember that our house is an open house. And our story isn't simply about John Wesley. It's more than that, if I may say that. It is about the same God who made that promise to Abraham. The same God Joshua is talking about. The same God who sent his son Jesus Christ to redeem the world. The same God who strangely warmed John Wesley's heart, who advocated provenient grace, and therefore the invitation to share the Lord's Supper, which we will do later, is around, as Martin has said, an open table. That is our story. And we share it not only with our visitors today, for as far as we're concerned, open house doesn't just happen one weekend every year. We are an open house throughout the year and all are welcome in this place. Amen.